Coming up on today's Locked On Senators, we have a pair of end of season interviews for you, but one of them is going to be a bit different. Yeah, we felt it wasn't really fair to grade Josh Norris's season with limited amount of games, so we're going to focus on his expectations for next season. A crucial piece to the puzzle for the Ottawa Senators. All that and the Maple Leafs have stayed alive for now. A little Stanley Cup playoff talk, and it's all brought to you by the Game Time app. Download the app and create an account and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first ticket purchase at Game Time. This is the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Jake Sanderson, and you're listening to Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Tim Stützle, and you're listening to the Locked On Senators podcast. Welcome inside episode 797 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains, please like and subscribe wherever you download your podcast. We're also available on YouTube where we are inching closer and closer to 1 million views. Please help us hit that. Today is Thursday, May 11th in Pillsy. I'm extremely excited for these two end-of-season reviews because... If the Senators are going to have that unparalleled success, these two guys are going to be a big part of it. Yeah, and I think, Ross, you can point to quickly the a big reason why the Ottawa Senators weren't able to achieve more success this year was because they didn't have Josh Norris for most of the year. And Ridley Gregg, you know, kind of taking those steps towards becoming a pro player and wasn't quite ready to be a full-time NHLer for the entire season. So now that he's got some NHL games under his belt, he's got some AHL games under his belt as well, hopefully next year he can make a big step. We'll get into all those. But let's start with a little playoff talk. Both Canadian teams get wins last night. The Toronto Maple Leafs stay alive with a 2-1 win over the Florida Panthers. It's now 3-1 series going back to Toronto for Game 5. And the Edmonton Oilers jumped out to a 4 nothing lead against Vegas. The blowouts continuing. Now Vegas gets a goal late in the third period to make it 4-1, but that series is tied at two. And did you see at the end of the game, the Petrangelo like, cross-check on Leon Dreisaitl and just a complete gong show as the clock ticked down? Yeah, Ross, I didn't catch the game, but I saw that replay, and that's about as malicious as it gets. Like, the puck is long gone. The play has shifted to the other side of the ice. And Pachanzo beelines it for Drysaddle and just gives him the two-handed chop, the tomahawk chop right on his hands there. And good on McDavid for right away just going after him, though. That's what I like to see that. Like, McDavid just being like, no, you can't do that. He's one of the world's best players, Drysaddle, and I won't have that. So... It's going to be interesting to see how that goes, Ross, because if Petrangelo gets a suspension, which I believe he should get a game for that, like that, there's just no excuse for that. That's massive for uh, deciding how this series is going to go, especially since it's tied up in two. Well, easily he gets a game because it's got to be. Gonna, well, and I mean, kind of the X factor is, is, is it going to be tick for tack? Because Darnell Nurse then got an instigator penalty in the final five minutes for his fight with Nick Haig, where they were throwing absolute haymakers in that. That's a big fight, yeah. Right, but because he got the instigator in the final five minutes, that's a match penalty and an automatic one-game suspension. It can be rescinded by the league, but you look at at that, and then you look at what Petrangelo did, there, there can't be the same punishment for those two crimes. I think that Petrangelo might even get two games. I think he should get two games. That's that's ridiculous. He tomahawks him right in the face. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. It, there's like no excuse or no way around it. Two two games in the playoffs is, is a lot. I I think it'll end up being one game, but if it's two games, so be it. Yeah, great, great hockey though. Like the the yeah. Edmonton Oilers when they're when they're clicking. I don't know if there's a more fun team to watch in the National Hockey League. Like this this Evan Bouchard kid. We were looking at him at fourth overall in 2018. Yeah. 
I think the Sens made the right decision going with Brady Kachuk, but <laughs> we, we knew this guy had a ton of talent. He ends up going, I think, 10th, 8th, something around that range uh, to the Oilers, and now he's the boosh bomb is is wildly uh, successful. He's just hitting hitting goals like it's no, nobody else's business. So he's able to, to get on the board. Matias Ekholm had an unreal goal too, and the Oilers, I, I'm all in on the Oilers, man. I really think they're the, they're the team that grabs my attention the most of the uh, of the remaining teams right now. Yeah, they're they definitely have the star power, and now they have some depth that can get it done too. I don't I don't know who who I've got pegged as the favorites now, Ross. Like honestly, part of me thinks Seattle might get it done just because they have the depth. They seem to have kind of the culture and the unity that they can go on a run here. So we'll see how it goes, and they don't rely on the star power like an Edmonton or Toronto does. So. Yeah, well, just like Edmonton, the Seattle Kraken series tied at two. That game five is tonight. We also have game five in the Devils and Hurricanes series where they decided it's just going to be blowout every single night. Yeah. The Canes lead that series 3-1. But the one game they lost, they lose 8-4, and they were down 7-2 in it as well. But uh, last night, the Leafs, they get the win 2-1. Uh, you nervous that they're going to make a comeback? No, no, I'm really not. I mean, honestly, Ross, I was – kind of hoping for this it would have been great to keep the narrative they didn't win a game in game in round two so whatever you can't count it blah blah that would have been a nice narrative to keep but the thing that's fun about the Leafs losing is when they have hope like it's like if they just got swept like they wouldn't have had hope for like a couple weeks here so I want them to have a little taste of hope you want them to win game five no (laughs) I want them to have a taste of hope and then lose game five at home in front of all their fans. That's that's the ultimate uh, treat for me. So I, I wasn't upset. I was quite sure they were going to win game four. So I, I wasn't really that upset. So I'd like it now. Gentlemen sweep and at home in front of their miserable fans. A one goal game, though. I mean, it went right down to the wire. Uh, the Panthers didn't really push with the goalie pull, though. I was a little disappointed with that effort. Is Barkov has to be hurt, by the way. Yeah, he, uh, Ross, I almost feel like, uh, and maybe our our friend Armando at uh, Locked On Panthers could uh, tell us more about this, but I almost feel like it's getting to a point, and it's only been one season, where they need to give Matthew Kachuk the C. Like, it just seems like he is the leader of that team. And and I don't want to demote Barkov, it's more elevating Matthew Kachuk, like, that team lives and dies with his play and and his attitude. And you see the difference when he's on his game and he's not. I mean, hell, this team was soft and so close to not making the playoffs until his dad comes out and calls out the whole team. And then they turn things around. Like, I don't know. Well, I can tell you that Barkov's in year one of an eight-year, $80 million contract. I don't think he's getting the C stripped anytime soon. Um, this isn't a this isn't a Blake Wheeler situation. Well, look, look at Matthew Kachuk's contract, though he's in year one of probably similar dollar amounts. So yeah, I think he's making more. But no, I think he's making nine point five. Nine five. Yeah, you're right. So there you go. I'm the captain. I make more money. <laughs> but in all seriousness, that team is uh, they're gritty, man. I, I just think Sam Bennett's been the most noticeable centerman that they have. So I think that probably speaks a little bit more to him than than Alex Barkov. And who knows, maybe Barkov's playing hurt, but he just looks slow out there. And you're used to him like making moves in tight, and he's just doing none of it. So we need more from Barkov. Let's call a game winner for Barkov on Saturday uh, against the Toronto Maple Leafs. All right, or is it Saturday? No, it's no. tomorrow. Wow, they're. they're- uh, Blink, Blink 182 had to like maneuver there because I'm going there tonight and then and then Blink goes to Montreal and then back to Toronto. So they, they had to make this gap here. Wow. Don't blink or you'll miss the next Leafs game because they've had these two days off now in back-to-back games. It was game, two days off, game, two days off. Ridiculous. But no better time to have those extra days off than when the Leafs are down 2 nothing and then 3 nothing in the series. Yeah, so the city can just fester and, and boil and stew in those losses. Amazing. Well, let's get into some Senators talk. And it just makes me so jealous. Every time we talk about the playoffs, I get a bit of a hater energy to me mm-hmm. because I want the Ottawa Senators to get back 
to that level. So coming up next, we'll get into two centermen who are going to be key contributors if and when that happens. Ridley Gregg, Josh Norris, season in reviews next. You're listening to Locked On Senators. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. If you want to see Blink-182 or the Leafs, you can do that by getting tickets at Game Time. And you may be thinking, well, there's no way I can get tickets now. It's too late. Game Time is the specialist in last-minute ticket deals. You don't have to stress when you use the Game Time app because you can get tickets to all your favorite sports games, music concerts, comedy festivals, even theater near you. And you don't need to stress because Game Time makes it easy. They have a Game Time guarantee, which means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. And you get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect before you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds, just two taps, one, two, and boom, you got your tickets on your phone. Don't worry about busting out the printer. Don't worry about getting more cartridge ink or finding the right paper. None of that. It's all in your phone and easy to access. So download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty bucks off your purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On NHL for twenty bucks off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Today's episode is also brought to you by Owl and Co. Grooming. Now, because Owl and Co. Grooming is as big of a Sens fan as you are, he wants everyone to know, and it's our guy, Chris St. Clair, and he wants us to know that Owl and Co. Grooming can make your morning routine something that you look forward to. That's new. Whether you're looking for finally taking care of your beard, or if you're a woman and you're looking to add more nourishment to your hair to help protect it against the sun. Now that the weather's turned, this is a great starting lineup to have hair tonics, sea salt sprays, utility bombs. It's versatility at its finest. All the products at Owl & Co. are made with natural ingredients, such as coconut oil and sweet almond oil to ensure your skin is getting the nourishment that it needs. Carefully chosen ingredients like shea butter are used to be safe for sensitive skin. No time for blemishes here. Go outside your comfort zone and start with these products every morning. You can find them all at owlandcogrooming.com. Owl & Co. Grooming is all about finding you a grooming routine free from complications. Follow them on Instagram as well, Owl & Co. Grooming, Owl & Co. Grooming. And for Locked On Sens fans, you have a special discount. So use Senators15 for 15% off your order. Perfect. Mother's Day coming up around the corner. Go to Owl & Co. Grooming. Owl & Co. Grooming. OwlAndCoGrooming.com Right, Pilsy. We've had a great week here at Locked On Senators, and we do have to let everyone Ooh, know. Yeah. No show tomorrow. We are taking a uh, professional development day, a PD yeah. day tomorrow. Yes, I like that. For Locked On Senators. But we'll be back Monday. Great week planned. Yeah. Interview with Belleville Senators head coach next week, David Bell. Get into some prospect discussion with him. Mark Mathot will be on. Meth is actually covering the OHL finals right now between – did Guelph make the finals? Did I read that yesterday? I don't think so, but I, I that's an did. egg on my face if they did, some Guelph Storm fan. It, it's against London. I know that, right? Oh, Peterborough Pete. Yeah, okay. There you go. Same, same uh, Pantone there, Ross, so I'll give you a pass on that one. But no, my Guelph Storm did not make it that far. Well, I can tell you the London Knights did. So Oliver Bonk will be involved in the uh, the OHL final. And with that, yeah, so Meth will be covering that. So we'll get his take. London there. Knight alum. We There you go. We want to time this so that he comes on right after the Leafs are eliminated from the playoffs. So stay tuned for all that coming up next here on Locked On. Senators next week. Again, no show tomorrow. No show tomorrow. But you can follow us on Twitter at Send Central and on Instagram locked on dot senators for content we're probably going to post our end of season that we did on Claude Giroux Brady Kachuk and Tim Stutzla we'll post that on the YouTube tomorrow for a little bit of content if you just want some background um, noise at work or whatever the case may be 
All right, today's exit interview, let's start with the similar exit interviews to what we've done in the past with Ridley Gregg. Ridley Gregg got to play 20 NHL games this year. Pilsy, if I had told you that before the season, would you have said over or under if I had put it at 19 and a half NHL games in his first full pro year? You know what? It, since you worded the question, if you told me that at the start of the year, what would have I said? I probably would have said under, to be honest. Yeah. And Pierre Dorian said he wanted to wait 50 games of <laughs> AHL, and then he called him up. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> and, he's uh, coffee, and he's like, you know what? He deserves to be up. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that that was very funny because, uh, but Pierre did uh, apologize for that. He was like, "Look, there was a material change. Things had to change. We had to get him in there." So that, that's fair. It happens. But Ridley Gregg is very interesting. If you're watching on YouTube, Ross got the graphic up here. Great graphic designing job, Ross. They've been looking uh-huh. fresh. All these graphics. Uh, so for Ridley Gregg, twenty games played, two goals, seven assists, and. Some nice uh, advanced analytics, Ross. I'll let you read these off. Yeah, so his expected goals percentage, which means it takes into account the quality of shot and all that. When he's on the ice, the expected goals percentage, 59% in favor of the Senators. And the Corsi, the shot attempts at 5-on-5, 53.8. And he did that all while averaging just under 13 minutes per game. Now, the fans... Very appreciative of Greg's efforts this year. The vote on Twitter at Send Central, 73.7% gave him a B grade. And because he's coming from Major Junior, there's still two years left on his contract at $863,000. So that's the type of deal you want in your bottom six. Pilsy, going back to how his NHL career started, this guy came in flying. Seven shots on goal in his first NHL game, was throwing everything at the net, played a ton of ice time with Claude Giroux, his childhood favorite player. So a cool storyline there. And we know that there's still, I believe, another level to unlock with Ridley Gray because we saw it in junior. The style that he plays is to bother everybody around him. Nobody on the other team is comfortable when he's on the ice. If the shift disturber wasn't already in use for Parker Kelly, this is the type of style that we're going to see from Ridley Gregg. I think it's just a matter of getting his feet under him. It's just like Tyler Clevin, where it's like he played well, he was poised, but he he hasn't unlocked that full complement of his skill set at the NHL level where he's willing to just kill guys and hammer them and doesn't want to be out of position, whatever the case may be. I think Ridley Gregg is in a similar position where this, and I'm not trying to spin on this, I do think it sucks that the Senators weren't able to make a deeper push to make the playoffs at the end of the season, but the valuable games that Ridley Gregg got here with 20, I think he's going to come in after a – he needs a big summer. Let's put it this way. Because the one thing on Ridley, and I'm, I'm sure that talking from to Tyler Boucher, who lived with him last summer, or Jake Sanderson, and this guy's doing his best trying to put on weight. And it's not easy for everybody. Maybe he's got to wait a year or two till that metabolism slows down. I'm uh, hand up a guy who's definitely been in that situation before. Yeah. I uh, used to be able to eat those brownie earthquakes at Dairy Queen. Uh, the good old days. Yeah, and now one – one medium blizzard. What is it in a big daddy where Adam Sandler's like, I have a chocolate shake and my ass jiggles for a week. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's, that's where we're at now. But with Ridley Gregg, I mean, he's eating protein shakes every day. He's trying to get, get, uh, get up. But if he can get to like 195, 200 pounds, maybe that's even pushing it. This guy's going to be a complete monster to deal with on the ice pills. Cause we saw it at times. Like this guy, when he gets the puck down low, like, he, he, he wants to protect it down there. It's just about building the strength to be able to do it against men at the National Hockey League level. Yeah, it's definitely an, an adjustment. And I think that uh, you're, you're hoping that with time and getting comfortable in the NHL that you can, you can get a little more comfortable in playing that agitator type role. So I'm not totally surprised that he, he's not at that level yet in the NHL, Ross, but We've seen even in Belleville that he can get to that point. I mean, there, there's that story that uh, Igor told us how he he doesn't care about anything. And he was getting under the skin of Kyle Clifford with the Marlies, which, I mean, that's a pretty intimidating dude with a bunch of NHL experience. So that just goes to show you really Greg's attitude. But 
kind of the and, and maybe maybe we can uh, park this for later, Ross. We can get into more his season, but I want to have a discussion about whether we see Ridley Gregg as a centerman or a winger in the future. But we can go over a little bit more of his uh, his game before we get to that discussion. This past season, he played almost exclusively at center, and a lot of it on the second line when Shane Pinto. They they just I probably wanted to give him a breather from going up against those top six matchups all the time. He slid down to the third line and Ridley Gregg went in and played second line center. His most common line mates this year, funny enough at five on five this year, Pilsy, he played 139 minutes with Alex to and only 84 minutes without him. So almost okay. double the amount of time with and without and their numbers together, their shot attempts for at five on five, 54.6%. Without Debrinkit, Greg was still at 52%. But without Greg, Debrinkit was down at 47%. So was he the the Alex Debrinkit whisperer? I say tongue-in-cheek, but it is worth noting that together, Ridley Greg made Alex Debrinkit better than he was without him uh, at 5-on-5. Five five. We know Debrinkit obviously a lot, a lot of skill on the power play as well. But I just love that. I love the kind of two-way game that he's going to bring at the next level. I think this year was a, a great get-your-feet-wet game. And, Pilsy, I, I think kind of the funniest stat with, with Ridley Gregg is he scored two goals this year. One of them was the – actually, I need to get the exact number. I don't want to get I know this. where you're going with this. I know that his first career goal was a 7-2 yes. win over St. Louis. And then he scored the second goal – in a 7-2 loss. So the seventh goal in a 7-2 win and the second goal in a 7-2 loss, the two goals for Ridley Gregg this year. Uh, was a really cool moment, though, his first goal being assisted by Claude Giroux again. And um, I, I'm just excited for the future for Ridley Gregg. There was a time there where it really ducked down. Like He came in gangbusters, right? Three assists in his first five games, 11 shots on goal, including what we mentioned. Uh, it was eight, actually, in, in the game one, yeah. not seven, eight in game one. And, then there's a bit of a lull there, Pilsy. They sent him down. They said, hey, go down, work on it. He comes back up uh, about two and a half weeks later. And then it was just kind of, you know, some decent games, some bad games. Actually ended the season, though, on a three-game point streak. So he's got that going into next year. Yeah, the thing with Ridley Gregg this year, and again, it all comes down to, to Josh Norris, who we're going to get into, is – it was hard to put him in the proper place because they needed a second line center so that Pinto could be put in his proper place as a third line center. But I believe Ross that Ridley Gregg was not ready to be a second line center in the NHL. And that's a big task to push on, push on him. And where I want to go with this Ross is I believe if Ridley Gregg is going to have success in this Ottawa centers organization, they need to transition him to the wing. You yeah. mentioned it. He's a guy that doesn't have a lot of weight on him, so that's going to make things tough in the face-off dot, which we saw his face-off numbers weren't that great in his rookie year. I mean, most rookies aren't that good, but having some weight and some strength really helps out in that case, especially when you're a second-line center. You're going up against big, experienced centers typically, so that's tough. And I just feel like his game translates a little bit better on the wing where he can just have his little assignments along the boards. He can play agitator in those puck battles. He doesn't have to worry so much about uh, defensive responsibilities and roaming the ice because I wouldn't say really Greg's a bad skater, Ross, but it's not what makes him a good player, right? So if you can have him on the wing where he doesn't need to have that speed and roaming around as much, I think he'll have more success and I mean, everybody take a drink every time Pillsy says this guy needs to be a top runner for a third line winger. But I'll throw Ridley Gregg into that as well. So right now I've got Soklov. Um, why am I blanking on the new guy's name? Yuri Smekal. Smekal. Smekal and uh, Ridley Gregg. Those are my top three guys that I want to see play a wing position on the third line alongside Pinto and Joseph. And because the thing is, Ross. I'm not saying there's no opportunity for Ridley Gregg to have success down the middle. But if you're going to play on the Ottawa Senators, there kind of is no opportunity for that. You've got your centermen locked in Norris, Stutzla, Pinto, and Kastelik, in my opinion. So if he's going to find a place, I think the only place that makes sense is third-line winger. And injuries happen. 
even within a game, you can move him back to center. I, I don't hate that idea at all. And the left side of, of the Senators' offense down there is, is certainly, you know, a battle, I think, in terms of the bottom six. And this is going to be a theme all summer. Who should play in the bottom six to give the Senators the best chance to win hockey games? Because there's been too many times where there's just zeros from the bottom six, but it seems like they do have a plethora of options. It's just how can they piece the puzzle together to get the best results. I, I'm with you there. I think that on the wing with the Ottawa Senators, probably likely, but in Belleville, exclusively played center. In the NHL this year, exclusively played center. I think the Sens want to develop him as a centerman, and I think this is a great question to ask David Bell, who was his coach for some games this year, what his game brings at center, or if he thinks that it will translate skill-wise to the wing, because he's got good vision. He's got a decent shot, but I think what he does best is get to the dirty areas. And is that easier to do when you're a centerman? Yeah, and that's a fair point. Uh, my pushback to that, though, Ross, would be, did he play center in this organization because that's what they wanted or because that's what they needed? Well, the Ottawa Senators' center depth obviously was totally messed up this year. So they needed a second-line center. So they put him there. And then in response to Ottawa's center depth being bad, Belleville didn't have any center depth. So part of me wonders if that was just uh, out of necessity or, but then again, if you're putting guy, your blue chip prospects out of position, out of necessity, that's not exactly a recipe for good development either. So I, I'm very interested to see David uh, or hear David Bell's take on that. And another part of that is, is it also smart to have a guy who's had three surgeries on his shoulder playing center? Or should he be the guy that moves to the wing? Coming up next, we will get into Josh Norris's small season that was eight games worth. And what should the expectations be for the Senators' $8 million man down the middle? That's all coming up next. You're listening to Locked On Senators. All right, you're listening to Locked On Senators, your team every day. We're a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, local experts on the biggest stories. A reminder, you can follow the show on Twitter at Send Central. You can follow us on Instagram, LockedOn.Senators. And please subscribe to the YouTube page. We just hit 5,600 subscribers Woo. just last week. And we are, what, 10,000 views away from 1 million Pilsy overall? We're pretty close. Uh, last I checked, I think we we're at 987. So okay. very close. That's something that, uh, I mean, we're not there yet, but I anticipate we'll keep the show running long enough that we should get there. Um, that's something if you would have told us a long time ago, we'd get a million views on YouTube. I never would have believed you. So uh, we can't thank our fans enough. It's, it's insane the support we've got and we appreciate all of you. We appreciate it like crazy. And if this team has any sort of success that we expect oh. next season, I'm hoping for a million during the season. Pilsy. We're going to the moon. We're going to the moon. Playoffs, including playoffs here. Because uh, as we've said before, this is episode 797 now. And we haven't covered a single playoff game. <laughs> Zero playoff games. And you know what the funniest part is? Because somebody asked recently, should I start at the beginning? Yeah. yeah. I go back and listen. It was Kels, on, Kels. Uh, on Twitter. So we appreciate her for doing that and, and mentioning that. We need an update. Where, where are you at? But yes. funniest part of it all, Pilsy, is our RSS feed, so the podcast feed, transferred over from Making Sense of the Sense. You can go <laughs> back to the days of us in the basement at the College of Sports Media, yep. and you can go and find that. But you know what the funniest part is, Pilsy? It started at episode 32. I don't know what happened to the SoundCloud episodes way back. So the episodes that we did during the run to the Eastern Conference Final don't exist anymore. No. So we literally have zero playoff. Like the first episode that transferred over is basically the Matt Duchesne trade. So it was like <laughs> the height of high after the run. And then it's like. Is this rock bottom was episode like five that's on that? It's like, yeah, probably not. Awesome. Love that. It, wait, is our uh, airing of grievances episode available? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. 
That's for for people that say we're was, we're blindly optimistic and all positive. Listen to our airing of grievances episode. Oh, that man. was actually the day before the 2020 draft because we're like, okay, this is changing a new leaf. So that's years after these. Um, Death by three thousand cuts would be an episode to go back and listen to. That was where they traded Duchesne Stone and Dzingle. <laughs> That's verbal meme. The dragons, where it's like two mean-looking dragons and one one, one goofy one. one. That's Dzingle in that conversation. No disrespect. We're talking about bringing back former senators yesterday on the show. Yes. Uh, Dzingle did two tours of duty here, and uh, we threw out Connor Brown's name yesterday, so you can go check that out. Uh, Pilsy had a couple names for you as well. Bottom six options, and we had some very fair comments. And we're going to do an episode on the cap and the situation going forward. We're waiting a couple more weeks. We want to wait a little bit closer to the draft just in case, you know, an Eric Branstrom, a Shane Pinto sign so that we have more concrete numbers going into next season with the RFAs, even a Julian Gauthier, like is his money going to be back on the book? So we will have an episode coming with the cap situation because guys were saying, hey, if you're adding a $3 million guy on the third line, you're adding a, a guy and no spoilers, go listen to yesterday's episode for all the names. But if you're going to put a fourth liner who's making more than league minimum or over a million dollars, Pilsy, that's a Brinkett contract. It's looking difficult to fit in if you're going to upgrade at these other positions. And oh yeah, you probably need a goalie as well. No, you do need a goalie. Um, at, yeah, I've... I've been conscious of the cap for a while, Ross. I've try I've been trying to tell you it's going to be an issue, but I think the key cap? the cap or the cat. <laughs> I mean, they're they're intertwined. The cap cat, the cat cap is uh, a big deal here. But that's why I've said all along, I've never wavered from this. Alex DeBrinket long term is is not going to be a thing. It just doesn't make sense. I think the Sens need to keep him short term to take advantage of the window of the couple entry-level contracts they have in Jake Sanderson, Ridley Gregg, and uh, some of these other guys that can possibly come up and play a role in the Ottawa Senators. All right, our final exit interview today is Josh Norris. Now, on Twitter, I asked this morning, what are your expectations for Josh Norris next season? Already 40 replies and counting. Lots of different ways to look at this. We've got... Our guy, Damian Smith, saying 30 goals, 30 assists as a shutdown defensive center. Then we got guys who are just saying, please stay healthy. Continue to bring the vibes. It's difficult right now where you're looking at a guy who tried to come back, and he's such a team guy. He's such a well-liked individual. We had his dad on last summer, Dwayne Dwayne Norris. We got to get Josh on on the show as well. You know we almost did. Remember that? Yes, I I do remember. Yeah, our our boy Parley almost had that interview uh, set up in the Making Sense of the Sens days, but didn't work out. Well, no, he was supposed to call us, and then Tessa Bonum had to record a podcast um, at TSN. So whether he called or not, we weren't in the room. We were pigeon toss as interns. We were told, hey, "Oh, right, that was that was back in our TSN side studio days." Heck yeah! So very, uh, very swing and a miss on that one. But we will try to get Josh on the show. But you look at you look at what he brings off the ice. Of course, the intangible he already wore it in, and I know Drake Batherson got to wear it at the end of the season. That would have been Josh Norris's a to wear. Uh, when Thomas Shabbat was out of the lineup there uh, towards the end of the season. But you look at what Josh Norris has in his bag of tricks, and it's it's a bit of everything. Like, he is, to me, the, the perfect utility centerman on this team. Now, he only played eight games because of the shoulder injury this past season. Tried to come back. He battled through it. Two goals, one assist, three points. Like, the the... Underlying numbers for Josh Norris have have been fantastic over the last three years. He's been a bright spot on this team. 59% expected goals percentage when he's been on the ice this season at 5-on-5 in those eight games. The Corsi numbers, 5-on-5 shot attempts, 55.5. Now, he played just a second under 18 minutes per game, but in those games he got injured, obviously that brings that right down because DJ Smith has relied on him time and time again to be a go-to guy on this team. Like he, when he's at his best, I think he's playing more and more pills. And you look at seven years left at $7.95 million. I put it did not qualify for a fan grade. I thought it would have been silly to put out that uh, for such a small sample size. But when you look back at this small season that was for Josh Doris, what comes to mind beyond the injury? 
I mean, not a whole lot, unfortunately, because it was such a small sample size. I think it was tough for me, Ross, when we knew he was healthy, he was traveling with the team, he was practicing, he was skating, and it was that weird limbo of one or two weeks where every like all systems were go, but they were worried about bringing him back, and Sens fans were divided between being like if he's healthy what are we doing we need this guy in the lineup or the other side people being like no i still think you need to wait it's a shoulder injury we don't need him re-injuring it let's wait let's wait and unfortunately i don't think there's a right answer there i think it just if it was going to happen it was going to happen and it's unfortunate especially ross because shoulder injuries for a centerman that's a big deal in the face-off dot well, we saw it. He didn't take a single face off in the three games when he came back. You're like, yeah. oh, that's not a good sign. Exactly. And that's why there was questions being like, wait, so he is healthy, but not healthy enough to take face offs as a sentiment. What are we doing so, here? And he's so good at face offs. Like, yeah, that's what I wanted to get into, Ross. Like, you start looking at this. His first season, sure, he only plays three games, but 61.2% in the face off dot. Next season, he plays 56. 52.3%, then 66 games, 51.1, and then in the limited amount of time, uh, last season he gets 57.9. So this kid has consistently been above 50% in the NHL in the faceoff dot. So that's such a huge part of his game that, Ross, I'm worried if he's going to get kind of the yips about doing faceoffs with that bum shoulder. Uh, I mean, both of his shoulders have had uh, issues now. So. I'm worried that's going to have an effect on his face-off ability. And then with that, Ross, you could say, well, get a winger that's good at draws with him. But we've already anointed Brady Kachuk and Claude Giroux to be on that top line with uh, Tim Stutzla. So how do you deal with this issue of him having shoulder problems and uh, taking face-offs at a rate that a second-line center would? He's not the first guy to have this shoulder procedure done and come back and play in the National Hockey League. I think if if he's had this much time now, I think you just play him at center. If that's if that's what he if he thinks he's a hundred percent, I think you just put him in at center. That's where he's most effective. Now, the question that I want to get to though, Pilsy here, is does his role change now that Timmy is officially a superstar 90, 100 point guy? Does Josh Norris now, I know the pressure's kind of off of him compared to before to produce all the offensive numbers. Should he try to almost become more of a defensive, spe- not specialist like you like you would in a bottom six, but do you think that there's a different kind of role for him next season? Or should he just continue to kind of do what he did as his development path dictated where he just scores a ton of goals and, uh, and you kind of go from there as a shoot for a center who can still play defense? I would say his role has changed, Ross. Before the season, we weren't really sure who the number one centerman was going to be. And I think most people, probably myself included, I'd have to go back and check, but still had Josh Norris as this team's number one center before the season started. But Tim Stutzla, he's on another level. Like there, There is and cannot be any debate whether Stutzla is this team's number one center. He is. I think that's fair to say. Now, with Josh Norris, I think when you're a guy that your your lethal shot is your best attribute, I don't want him to play more defense to take away from the offense. But now that you know you're not that top guy, I think you de- do need to play a bit more of a two-way game, but I don't want it to deter him from ripping pucks in the offensive zone. So I think his role changes in the effect that the expectations of him being a number one guy aren't there anymore. And he's going to have to find different ways that he can contribute when he's going to be getting less ice time than he's typically used to. And with Josh Norris last season, yes, he had a different shoulder injury and, and he missed uh, what 15 games. If, if so, yeah, 14, 15 games and still was able to score 35 goals. But 
it's to me, it's just unfortunate that it was the same one because in his rookie year, he went 56 for 56, played every single game. And I, I don't see this as a damaged product where he's injured and he's never going to get back to playing 82 game seasons. I, I truly believe, and maybe I'm I'm being naive, I hope not, but I really think that a full summer off and getting the proper surgery, not just trying to rehab it and come back, I think it's going to be a full reset for him. I hope that he's 100% enough to train this summer and be ready to go because we can't have any slow starts next year. It's all systems go. Game one, no excuses. Let's go. That's the the mantra for next season, by the way, is no excuses. Like It's go time. It's go time. It's year seven. It's go time. It's go time. Yeah, definitely. I'm not saying year seven for Josh Norris, but for the rebuilder, for the team being from where they were to where they are now. Josh Norris, though, he's going to be 24 years old. um, Or sorry, 23, just turned 23. um, All through next season. Like, I'm expecting a big season. Like, I don't think that, I don't think it's crazy to expect 35 goals, 30 assists, 65 points as a second line center with a lot of cookies coming on the power play from his, from his office on the left flank or right flank. Sorry. I hate to be this guy, Ross, but my expectations are going to be down a little bit. I you think he has to hit 30 goals. I hate to do this, but if healthy, I am still very gun shy about Josh Norris being able to get through a full 82 game season. Um, I think he's probably going to be a guy that's going to average around 60, 65 games a year. And I don't, I hope I'm wrong about this, but just. Well, if, you, we, if we had said this about Shane Pinto, you would have said that last year. Guy played 82 this year. Agreed. But Josh Norris has had more shoulder problems than, than Shane Pinto going back earlier. Um, and he, he plays, he plays more minutes. Right. Um, so I, I'm worried that this is going to be a continuous thing. I'm not saying It's going to take away from his talent. I'm just saying it could affect how many games he's able to play. I think, and and again, expectations don't need to be as high as they used to. I think as long as he's within the 25 to 35 goal range, that's fine. And and I think he can achieve that with a shot like that and getting time on the power play. I think he can do that. Ross, I I would say I'd put the over-under for Josh Norris goals next year at at around... 31 and a half like right around low 30s is kind of where I'm expecting him to finish which is great like I I don't I don't want to, this to sound like a negative thing like it's just I think expectations will be tempered a bit for him just because his role has changed and as a centerman with shoulder injuries that's going to affect your game big time is there any part of you that would start him on the wing next season Absolutely not. Yeah, no part of me is considering that just because he's so effective as a centerman and this team needs him as a second line center. Like, if he's a winger, where does he go? Well, you probably don't have 12 back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a different conversation. But if you have the roster as it is now, unless you're moving Giroud to center, which... They would have done it this year if he was... Exactly, exactly. So I don't see that happening. And I, I truly believe Josh Norris is most effective as a sentiment. Now, could he be a winger down the road? Sure. But as your question for next season, no, he's got to be the second line sentiment. Oh, I'm such a big fan of Josh Norris. I really, I'm cheering for this guy to get back to hundred percent when he's yeah. on his game, man, it's effortless. Like I was watching oh. the, the highlight tape preparing for this episode and, and going back to his 35 goals, 16 of them on the power play. And it's how many times did we say that season, especially in the postcast where it's like, you know the shot's coming, but there's absolutely nothing you can do because he's so quick and, and he can place it exactly where he needs to. And I think he does deserve a little bit more credit, at least around the league, and hopefully he starts achieving that this upcoming season with his defensive play. And now that you're able to have, like, I, I don't I don't want to do a comparable. I think he's a pretty unique centerman. I, I don't know if there's a whole lot of, like, shoot first centermen that, that are solid defensively and, and are able to kind of bring that to a game. But... Man, he he just feels like a perfect complement for a, a playmaking top six centerman in Tim Stutzla. Like you, you have one over the board, it's the next guy, and uh, hopefully we have a, a big year ahead for Josh Norris. So expectations, you're setting at 31 and a half goals. I'll say the over on that, but I also think that if he's if he's let's say because you would expect him at this point in his career to probably develop a little bit further from the 55 points that he had in 66 games. But if he gets 55 points next season, but he's like a plus 20 or plus 25, 
that's still to me a successful season for Josh Norris now as, as a second line center in the national hockey league. So number one, stay healthy. Number two, play a complimentary role to Tim Stutzla. Number three, get back on your horse on the power play and put the puck in the top bunk in the back of the net. So yeah. I know he's not a disher, Pilsy, but he's still able to put the puck in the net, and that's what we need from Josh Norris next season if the Senators are going to have any sort of success. Well, and it's ironic uh, you just said not a disher uh, coming into the last comment I want to make here, but... Hey, he said it, not me. Yeah, exactly. That's not a quote from me, guys. Don't don't put at Brandon Pillar, not a disher, every time uh, Josh Norris gets an assist, please. Uh, we got um, a uh, holidays coming back soon, by the way. Hell yeah, that's going to be good. But the last thing I want to mention about Josh Norris is... It's so important to emphasize how much having him back at center, second line center does for the roster makeup of this team. I've mentioned that a million times. Shane Pinto being the third slot, line center. The slotting. Yes, exactly. But also, Ross, he's got to get Alex Debrinkat and Drake Batherson going five on five. That yes. honestly might be the key to Josh Norris coming back is you got to get those two guys going at even strength. And because... That 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 was a big downfall to this team's lack of success. Was that second line even strength was not only not scoring Ross, but straight up was a liability at even strength. So he needs to change that. Well, before Josh Norris was injured, it was really to bring it with uh, Norris and Giroux was the winger. Josh Norris actually played more with Claude Giroux than any other player this season, and then to it was just seconds behind the next forward that. Uh, that he played with the most, Josh Norris at five on five, Drake Batherson. Guess how many minutes he played with Drake Batherson at five on five? It's it's going to be like nothing, like 15? Six minutes. Yeah. Six minutes and 19 seconds with Batherson, six minutes and one second with Matthew Joseph, and four minutes with Tyler Mott. That's his most common line mates this season. And I'm actually shocked Brady Kachuk is only there at three minutes. Those two were attached at the hip together the year before, but it really seems like they are going to try to break it. Norris, they can get some skates in this summer in Michigan as well. But for today, we got to wrap it up. Pelzi, any final thoughts before we go? I'm going to miss you while you're at the Rock Show tonight. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop it there. Otherwise, uh, it will get out of hand again. We did uh, we did that bit uh, yesterday. But yes, I'm very stoked for the Blink-182 concert. Just a reminder, no show tomorrow. I, I apologize. No tomorrow? Yeah, no show tomorrow. I apologize, guys. We don't do this very often. Like, Ross, I can't even remember the last time we did a no show when we were supposed to. So a uh, professional development day for us. And enjoy all the exit interviews. Ross is going to put those out on YouTube if you want to go back and listen to them. And, yeah, we have an awesome week next week. I'm very stoked for that. And I'm going to make it so that it doesn't go in the subscription feeds. We appreciate if you subscribe on YouTube and put the bell on notifications. So I don't want to spam it with three videos. Bang, bang, bang. Bingo, bango, bongo. I haven't said that one in a while. But but we are going to post them. So just check out the page, Locked On Senators. But for today, we say goodbye. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitt. And this has been the Locked On Senators podcast. Your team every day.